Good morning and a very warm welcome to our new money session this morning. Uh, we can say that we're probably the only session at the Edinburgh TV Festival that's promising you free money or maybe not so free. That's what we'll be looking at in just a moment. Uh, my name's Darshini David. I cover business and economics for the BBC, so I get uh, paid to lightly grill politicians, policymakers, and business leaders. Now, alongside me is Danny Fenton. He may be a familiar face to many in the audience because he is, of course, <laughs> the CEO of Zigzag Productions. He's also a dealmaker extraordinaire, which he'll be uh, showing us a bit more about. I didn't write that. <laughs> you, you told me to say that. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, not just about that. Um, we're talking about programme finance. And because whether we love it or loathe it, the world of programme financing is changing. Are we talking about the Wild West or could this actually be Nirvana? Well, we're going to hear from six different businesses this morning. They've got very diverse models they want to tell us all about for funding shows. Um, but we're not just here to sit back and listen. If you had a late night last night and you were hoping this would be a good session to actually catch up and a bit of sleep, I'm afraid not, because we're going to be putting them through their paces. Uh, Danny here is going to be interrogating them uh, about not just the merits of each scheme, but also the potential pitfalls as well. We want you to get involved. More on that in just a second. Danny. Yeah, so the, the session is, is really looking at the state of the economy of the, of the TV market. Um, public service broadcasters spend in the UK, that's BBC, ITV, Channel 4 and Channel 5, plateaued um, over a decade ago at 2.5 billion. So in real terms, it's actually shrunk significantly. Meanwhile, growth uh, from revenue streams, represented by today's panellists, has actually grown to 802 million in 2017, which is uh, 2017, which is an 11% year-on-year increase. So uh, as a proportion of industries funding, PSB is in decline in their funding, and today's speakers are gonna show you where the money is. Um, as a producer, and I'm slightly torn here because everybody I'm interrogating today, I'm hoping to work with as well, so it could be the end of a beautiful relationship. Um, but as a producer, the times are challenging, and it's more and more difficult to get your shows fully funded. And the people that we're gonna to see today will actually offer you some opportunities in ways of actually getting your projects funded. Can I just ask actually, before we sort of jump into the session, how many people here actually are producers? If you can put your hands up, so a smattering. And how many people are funders? So a few funders oh, as well. And how many broadcasters? Okay, so a fairly broad, broad spread. So, um, on with the show. Yeah, uh, well, let me just tell you the rules of the game because uh, we're going to get our speakers up one by one and hear from them. Uh, they've got five minutes each and uh, we're not the Oscars, so we haven't got a band to start playing at the end of the five minutes, but we are the Edinburgh TV Festival. We have a klaxon and no expenses spared. Very apt indeed. Uh, so when that klaxon sounds, they've got to stop speaking and it's over to Danny to actually grill them up. Because, of course, there's no idea of a free lunch. Money without strings attached can't possibly exist, can no, it? So no, no money for nothing no money uh, for in nothing. this industry. I will also be uh, looking at questions that you may have on the app. So if you have uh, some tougher questions than I have to ask, then um, please let me have them and I'll, I'll, I'll throw to them uh, after each presentation. And let us know who the questions are for as well. Absolutely. So we can make sure that they go to the right person. Um, and uh, that's not all either, because uh, it's, it's not fair to compare these models, because as they'll all tell you, they're offering something different. Um, but frankly, we want one question answered by you at the end of the session, which is, whose money do you want? So once uh, we've heard from all our speakers, there will be a bit on the app where you can actually vote for the model that appeals to you the most. And put it this way, if you don't vote, you don't get any money. Okay, just to warn you right now. Um, so without any further ado, um, I think we're going to start speaking. So uh, Paul Heaney, uh, I'm gonna invite you up to the stage because you are the CEO of TCB Media Rights. Now everyone you hear from today is going to say they're offering us something different. Uh, they're certainly all different from each other, but is it really different to the models we know? Paul, come on up and tell us exactly what you've got to do. Let me just give you a bit more details about Paul because uh, TCB Media Rights, <coughs> we launched that in 2012 now uh, to do something different in factual distribution. I'll make you make your own minds up about whether or not that is the case. Have Paul, my five minutes started? Your five minutes start now. Right, okay, let's roll the uh, slide. Okay. 
Okay, thanks to uh, my colleague uh, Jasmine for that promo. Fantastic. So um, we are uh, a distributor. We were uh, set up in 2012, as mentioned, to exist in the sweet spot between producer and broadcaster. There is a very sweet spot there, a bit like a US agent, and, um, and it's been a bit of a success so far, we think, over the last seven years, and over the last two years, we've uh, just about doubled, turnover about 22 million pounds this year. Uh, so what we're trying to do is um, carve out a bit of a, a niche and uh, give ourselves a method that maybe hasn't been done before, uh, because market forces have dictated it. There's no sort of eureka moment. Um, and the other major achievement, I think, I don't think other distributors hate us, but um, mm -hmm. which is also a really good achievement, I think, on our side. Um, so um, responding to market demands, as I said, so uh, we know what's happening now. We've got lower tariffs from uh, broadcasters. Payment schedules are shocking. Um, so in a way, we just thought, well, we have to do something about this. How do we encourage each other to be brave? Um, we do sometimes feel like we're producers' only hope. Um, and I actually like that feeling, to be fair, and, uh, uh, and we're very much up for it. Um, so um, we think uh, if we can do it, we, we like to use the phrase making the market um, because all we want are noisy hit shows that will return, you know, nothing uh, groundbreaking there. Um, so we have to make it happen ourselves because the content sometimes isn't out there or, or it's too hard to fund. Uh, so what we have to use are these strong buyer relationships and we have them. We now um, collaborate directly with the broadcasters, and this is responding to their demands as well. So with UK TV, with Channel 5, with Discovery, with Channel 4, with uh, CBS in Australia, as well with all the broadcasters there, and major co-pro broadcasters in the States. So um, we're just trying to exist across all the unscripted platforms. Um, trust is a big thing for us because um, we, we give a lot of information away to producers and, and buyers. That's what we do. Trust is... Um, is everything, but we're very, very loyal, and it, it's a very big thing for us. And we're nothing without integrity. Um, if standards drop, you know, we're finished. It can take years to build up, and very, very quickly it can diminish. So, um, and the alignment with indies, um, producers have very little, uh, um, very little fees now. Their fees are their back end. So this is why we have to sell the show. So we're in it. We're, we're sort of mutually aligned. We want you to make a good show because we want the thing to sell. Um, so, uh, what sort of deals do we offer? Um, we're not thrilled on one-off relationships. We want to make it bigger ones. I've only got, I've only got 30 seconds left. So core business, sales, pre-sales, first looks, commissions. We've got a commissioning editor now, Hannah's here. Uh, Jimmy runs all acquisitions and co-pros. We've got a duty of care. Criteria for decision-making needs to sell internationally. Um, we need to have the chemistry between producer and distributor. Uh, sometimes the genre is oversupplied. 15 seconds, I think. Um, how are we set up to do this? Um, well, let me just go straight to the green light process. There you go. Look, it's like ROI with a broadcaster straight through internal sign-off. We have lots of rows internally. Um, is it a good thing? Not necessarily. It's lots of risk, but the risk is now piling onto us and piling onto both of us, but we're in it for the long haul. What's the catch? There isn't one, actually. We're in it for the long haul, and that's it. Um, I think it's going well for us, but the thing is, we just have to work together. I make it, I've gone over five minutes. Anyway, I'll carry on. Oh, All right. <coughs> you, pulled, you pulled your own chain. Yeah. <laughs> Very impressive, Paul. Thank you. Just stay up here because I think Danny's Sorry, got some yeah. things he wants um, to have a chat about. Paul, I'd, I'd be interested to see this poll that other producers don't hate you. I don't know where you, where, where <laughs> you did that one from. I, I made it up. You made, made it, it up. Awesome. Yeah. Um, look, you are, you're without doubt one of the most charming people in the industry. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you have a very impressive business. Oh, he wants, yeah, sorry. <laughs> but isn't this all just a sort of giant Ponzi scheme? Um, I mean, who. Who can commission their own programs without a broadcaster? Uh, we've done it. So um, I don't know whether Ponzi scheme can make as many mistakes as, we, as we've made, because we, um, all you have to do is make sure that um, some shows just won't sell. Um, but you have to take that gut feel challenge. So I was going to say, there's, all, there's a brain in your gut as well. So we use, I went through that slide too quickly, but sales forecasts and projections and history and analysis that's what we base it on. Yeah, sometimes we commission a show with no broadcaster attached at all. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. So, um, yeah, I, I'm not familiar with the Ponzi scheme. I'll look it up. But I think... They, make, they make money normally. Generally speaking, we make money on the shows that are like Abandoned Engineering UK TV. It's the number one show on Science Channel, as Mr. Did Abandoned. That's a brilliant, brilliant example of how it works. Yeah. We've got a few examples of how it doesn't. So what we have to just... My, my theory is 65% of the things that we invest in will work. Yeah. So the other 35% won't. 
So you have to over deliver on a 65. You have to make sure those are really, really good hit shows. I was interested so that you, you, you talked about uh, the trust uh, and loyalty to your, to your producers. And I'm probably speaking as an outsider because we, we, we haven't worked together. Yet. But it, I get the feeling that what you have is sort of a private media members club and the information is only available to the no producers way. in the club. <laughs> no, no. No, we're, I'm, I'm way too trusting. I'm way too trusting. And I'm pleased that I am personally because, you know, there's one or two percent of the time when that trust goes and you find out you've just given a producer a load of information, they've given it to another distributor and away they go. But for that one or two percent of the time it happens, it makes you over trust everyone else if that isn't a new verb that I've just created. But um, no, um, it's not a private club because we're always, we always know we have to spread the net as far as possible because we don't know where the next idea is going to come from. And so... Yeah, it's a ridiculous um, numbers game in terms of making relationships count, but making sure we're talking to as many relevant people as possible. So no, I don't think, uh, as long as there's an obvious chemistry, you know, if, if there's mutual hatred, it doesn't really work, or distrust or resentment. But yeah, it's... it's and is there, in terms of the, the budgets and, and the rights, is there, is there a sort of fixed deal for producers, or how, how does no, that work? No, and if I hadn't have shut myself down too early, I probably would have said... Uh, no, there's uh, no deal is the same. Even within the same, I think Jimmy will probably uh, agree, um, even within the same producer, no deal is ever the same. There's always a different, uh, um, you know, because if someone's put, if we're putting in more money, then the commission's going to be higher. If we're putting in less money, commission's going to be lower. Will we take a bit of back end? Yes, sometimes. But, if, but that's dictated by how much we put in. And the, the plan is, and again, I shut myself down too quickly, the plan is to, um, to come back and get the producers coming back for more. So we, we do want... Um, we do want them thinking they're not being ripped off. So, you know, I'd love to take big, big, massive chunks of back end, but really, you're never mm. going to see it. And it's, and it's something that, that leaves a bad taste in producers' mouth anyway. My last... Uh, uh, no, you haven't got time for another question. I've got time for no, another question. I'm, I'm going to put the klaxon on you otherwise. Okay. Uh, well. I'm really sorry about that. Thank you so much. That Thanks. was an amazing way of filling in so much in five minutes. Was it? All right. Yeah. All right. Thank you. I think you've set you the bar it. very high there. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, next up is Jackie Edwards, and we talk about, you know, different models. This one is really quite different. Come on up, Jackie. Uh, because uh, Jackie is the head of the BFI Young Audiences Commissioning Fund, and I'm going to let her tell you more about that without taking up any of her five minutes. Jackie. Thank you very much. Um, hello, I'm Jackie, and I'm here from the BFI Young Audiences Content Fund, uh, which is a pilot scheme uh, from UK government and um, with the sole intention of revivifying the provision of public service content for young people in the UK. Um, so what is it, you ask? I hear you, or not? It's 57 million magical pounds. Uh, I say magical because it's non-recoupable, it's rights and equity free, um, it's grant and aid money, and it can be spent to, on the support of development and production finance uh, for UK public service programmes for young people. So. As I say, it's non-recoupable, which is magical and marvellous. It supports UK public service content, development production awards, and is a three-year pilot. So we're experimenting to sense check to see whether we can actually stimulate this sector again, which, as Danny alluded to, public service sector has uh, taken a real bashing over the last, last decade or so, and particularly with children's, there's been a 40% de decrease in spend in this sector. So... Ofcom has identified the need for it. There's a lack of programming that reflects the lives of young people in this country. And it's important that we do have this content for all sorts of reasons. We need to kind of give, give young people a chance to see themselves on screen, to have their lives described. Uh, and basically, the importance of public service content to educate, to inform, and entertain. So basically, the pro programs we're looking to be submitted um, have to have public service characteristics and we assess projects against these priorities quality innovation additionality you know hard to fund programs things that wouldn't get made otherwise without the support of this fund um, we're looking to reflect all of the UK so nations and regions programming we've got a target of five percent spend on indigenous languages programming um, diversity reflecting the UK in all of its gloriousnesses <laughs> Um, new voices, this doesn't mean sort of necessarily um, young people coming into the sector, but people from different parts of the media, uh, adult drama producers coming into the kids space, feature film producers, we're seeing all of this in the fund already and it's really stimulating the ideas that are coming through. Um, plurality, so basically a big point of the scheme is 
to increase the range of broadcast to tone of voice in the UK. In the children's sector, the BBC have been dominant for the last decade, so we want to hear ITV louder, Channel 4, Channel 5, and so that's a big part of our ambition as well. So development funding, what do you need to do? What do you need to support? What's going to get you a commission? We will fund any activity, and um, there's no limit on the amount of money you can ask for, but hey, be reasonable, everyone. Um, you don't have to have a broadcaster commitment, but you do have to have a broadcaster in mind. Um, and let's say getting new voices into this sector is a priority, and the money is largely non-recoupable unless you end up selling the show to a not-in-scope platform. Important to note. Production fund. We can give up to 50% of any production budget, um, but you have to have a commitment from a free-to-access UK Ofcom regulated public service broadcaster with a significant reach. Um, I say we put up to 50%. If you come to us with more than 50%, that's great news because we share the love further. But you can make up your 50% contribution from the broadcaster license, from UK tax credit, regional funding, international pre sales, or distribution advances. So it can be a very sort of mixed bag. Um, and you know, we know that some shows are not going to get an international pre sale because they're a very domestic focused. Uh, project as a lot of the shows will be given the nature of the fund but you know we are very open-minded and there are lots of ways of uh, making up your contribution which we will then match or thereabouts so this is the team we're all very helpful the fund is very accessible we will chat anybody through the process um, so please get in touch with your ideas and that's the whole point of this fund it's we want to make a difference. We want to create a cultural shift in this landscape of children's broadcast. Um, so if you've got great ideas that suit audiences up to 18 years of age, please come to us with them. It's a three-year pilot. We want to make a difference. And the way we're going to make a difference is getting the best ideas out there in front of audiences. So please apply. Exactly. Thank you. And... Uh... Very neatly finishing just ahead of the klaxon. That, that was very impressive. Um, as you say, a very underserved segment of the audience and uh, some huge ideas out there. Um, I'm going to get Danny to ask you a few questions about this. Before that, though, just a reminder, there is an app. You can put your own questions through. Uh, if you need to get on the Wi-Fi, by the way, uh, to do so, the password is Searchlight. So do get the questions coming in. But, Danny, over to you. Um, sounds too good to be true, Jackie. But it's like a unicorn. It's that magical, and it actually really exists. <laughs> yeah. I think you described it as magic money. Yeah. Uh, a magic money tree, I think you described it as as well. That. I'd never say that, Danny. I don't <clears> do that. <throat> it is fantastic, and it is a unique opportunity that I hope will go on in the future, but it's allowing broadcasters and producers to get ideas out there that they've not been able to for the last decade or so. So it's a fantastic opportunity. So basically, me and my team are going around and urging as many people to apply and get those ideas because it's a fantastic opportunity to develop new content, brilliant new content for young audiences, and they need it. So I looked at the application form to get the funding, which I, did. Which I think is about 14 pages long and asks so many detailed questions, Danny, including... Danny, Danny, clearly you've never filled in a media application form, have you? They're much longer. <laughs> so... The idea is not to try and vet producers by the complexity of doing filling in the form. We've tried to make it as accessible and easy to approach the fund as possible. At the same time, it's public money. So we've got to ask certain questions and we've got to interrogate uh, the veracity of uh, companies and the applicants. But really, we're trying to make it as, as accessible as possible to get as many people in, particularly inexperienced people in the sector as well. We want to hear those voices. And are the, are the funds recoupable? And do, do you take any rights? No rights, no recoupment. That's why it's magical. So a, quick, a question that's come in on the, on the app. Uh, Jackie, how do you ensure the production fund isn't just effectively subsidising PSBs so they can pay lower licence fees for the same content? Well, we've been having a very um, a great dialogue, actually, with public service broadcasters. And, you know, if we want to make a success of this as a community, and that's something I've been urging everybody to, to approach the fund in the right way, it's to benefit the benefit of all of us, producers, broadcasters, distributors... Um, that we make this success and it gives it an ability to go on in the future. It's for everybody. So everybody's got to play nice, right? And broadcasters are so far, people are coming up and putting contributions in. It's not sort of letting them off the hook in terms of fees at all. And are you a quango or are you, are you creatively deciding which projects go through? So um, 
it's all about plurality of broadcaster tone of voice. So commissioning decisions are the commissioning decisions of those broadcasters. We are there to help support the production of those shows. So the answer to the question is you don't have any creative... We have a light, a light touch in terms of are we getting uh, the thing delivered that we thought we were investing in. Okay. So, you know, if they say it's going to be this, we want to see this. So we have a very light... No editorial. Graphic. We don't interfere. I'm going to have to stop Mr Paxman there because we're out of time. But uh, Jackie, thank you so much for that. It's uh, a pleasure. Thanks as you for say, having me. The inspiring model. <laughs> OK, next up, without any further ado, Ross Belcher, Director at Infinitum Entertainment. And, uh, Ross, thank you, because I know you've stepped to the breach at fairly short notice. Uh, and also, just back from a holiday as well, so thank you for the gear change. And do tell us more about what you've got on offer. I will. Thank you. Um, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, let me introduce you to Infinitum. Our backgrounds are from the commercial side of television and media. Most recently, we ran the commercial team at Channel 5 during the uh, Richard Desmond era. A significant part of our commercial success came from working with a, in a new way with advertisers to get programming funded directly. This culminated in the sale of the channel to Viacom in 2015, old history, but we'd realized that there was an opportunity here to do this independently and extend our funding model across the market. So Infinitum was launched later that year. Um, we've put together a short video with our partners to help bring to life how we work. The industry needs Infinitum. We join up the dots between production companies, advertisers, media agencies, broadcasters, and increasingly other media owners hungry for television quality content. Infinitum help us by helping clients to achieve what otherwise their budgets wouldn't allow them to. We need uh, good quality relationships with television. We need the funding for the show. We need assistance with infrastructure, and this is what they bring to the table. What Infinitum do is unique because they help us deliver media value for our clients and also give us the opportunity to access TV-related content. Obviously, we have budgetary pressures, so anything that helps alleviate that while still not kind of undermining the requirements editorially obviously helps when getting certain projects signed off. I've worked with those guys for a long time now and I think there's, there's some trust there. So much of our business is about personal relationships and especially when you're trying to create something new, it's important that you trust the people that you're working with. The winners in this model are everybody that work collaboratively with us. We carry no leverage. We can't make people do this. It's just down to whether it makes great commercial sense. And our role is to make sure it does. Infinitum have helped us with two of our longest running projects, The Gadget Show and Fifth Gear. Gadget Show on Channel 5, Fifth Gear on Discovery. And they were both in serious danger of falling out of the schedules. But with Infinitum's help, we were able to get the funding in and relaunch and reshape them. And they're now getting more and more successful. So, how does it work? As Nick said, we joined the dots to make it happen. There are two key points to note in this process, though. Firstly, the content needs to be commissioned subject to funding. We need to be sure that the broadcaster wants the show. And secondly, we work with advertisers' media budgets, which pay for the production and deliver the media value. In the case of The Gadget Show, you heard from Neil on the video how Channel 5 wanted the show, but didn't have the budget to fund two series, so that's where we came in and worked with Dixon's Carphone and their media agency to get the funds for the show and deliver the media value they required. So what's in it for everyone? Well, for the advertiser, in this example, uh, Jeep funded Mission Mudder, a show on Sky, and received added value in the form of additional content, brand integration, program sponsorship, and we worked with the production company along the way, of course, to agree what was possible. Uh, for broadcasters, <coughs> excuse me, they get the show on air, which can either help reduce their program budget or simply access shows that they couldn't afford. 
In this case, Channel, 4, Channel 5 sorry, wanted boxing back on the channel, but just didn't have the money to do it. And this has been an enduring partnership with Channel 5 and the promoters continuing to deliver a good audience for them. Um, for producers, it means primarily that the show gets made, um, and with our model, often with preferable payment terms and without leveraging the IP. In this case, it meant getting fifth gear back on the screen. So what have we achieved in our first four years? Uh, 57 new shows commissioned, some highlights being funding of all the boxing, free-to-air boxing in the UK, a BAFTA award-winning series in Cruising with Jane MacDonald, uh, the longest-running factual entertainment show on, on commercial TV uh, in The Gadget Show, and as an independent <coughs> specialist... <laughs> as an indif I, I'll just spend two seconds. You start to see you're finished. Yeah, there are no restrictions on who we can work with, allowing us to deliver the best results for our partners. Well, thank you. Uh, Danny, over to you. So, Ross, as I see it, you're like a boutique media agency yeah. on Carnaby Street, which you are, and there are ad agencies who are sort of department stores, let's say, on Oxford Street. Why wouldn't a producer go straight to the agency rather than go through you? What, well, they can. It? Right. They can, and, and, and they do in some instances. I don't think it's a case ever of either or. It's more and. Um, you know, we, there are agency groups that make, that make content and they do it in their way. We work independently uh, with producers to, because we don't have any set agenda in the background about where it goes, what channel it has to go on, or any of that, and where the media value gets returned. <clears throat> so I'm quite pleased we're not a Ponzi or a Quango, but neither are we actually a media agency. So because we work with the agencies and the advertisers. What you are <laughs> is a bartering company. Well, you, yeah, okay. Program barter. And one of the great myth, one of the great dark arts of, uh, of our industry is the barter deal. Can you explain very briefly how it works? Because, I mean, we invited the artists formerly known as Group M, but obviously they won't talk publicly about their, their deals. So can you tell us about your deals? Uh, I, can, I can give you an overview. I tried to give you a bit of a way, it, because in five minutes it is difficult. Yeah. Um, and this is actually the first time we've actually been on, on stage talking about what we do. But re really, it, I mean, the first thing that comes to us normally is a production company. Comes to see us to say they've got this show, or it might be the broadcaster. They've got this show, they want it, the broadcaster wants it, and it's either going to be commissioned subject to funding or, or, or part, part funded. So we go, okay, and then it's, right, do we think that there is a commercial model in that mm -hmm. for someone out there to fund that <clears throat> and get a return, and if it's an advertiser directly, get an association with that show? Mm -hmm. It's not ad-funded programming. We're not, we're not taking shows that are already funded yeah. and trying to deliver them to broadcast. So because we're tight on time, I just want to establish. So as a producer, they would have a deal with you, yeah. they would have a deal with the broadcaster, and yes. then you would have a deal separately with the broadcaster that the yeah. producer is in party to. Yeah. We contract with everyone individually. So we'll do a deal with the broadcaster, whatever that entails, a deal with the production company and the advertiser. And can the producer see the deal you've got with the broadcaster? Uh, no. There's, confiden there's just confidentiality okay. in it, that's all. Okay. Dark arts is the word you used there. Wow. Um, listen, if you don't like Danny's lines of questioning... I mean, you don't like <laughs> Danny. <laughs> you don't like Danny. Put your hand up. If you like Danny, even, put some questions through on the app, please, for our, uh, for our uh, presenters today. Um, Ross, thank you so much. Thank really you. appreciate it. Thank you. Now, next up, please welcome our fourth speaker of the morning. Lucy Simon is SVP of Acquisitions and Business Development at The Story Lab. And, uh, Lucy, do tell us more about what you've got to offer. Hello. Um, right, my name is Lucy Sannon. I work at the Story Lab, and I'm going to start with a bit of a video to showcase some of the work we've been doing and then tell you a little bit more about it. So... Um, we are a distribution entity, we are a production entity, and we invest. Um, we are wholly owned by Dentsu, which is a very large uh, advertising and communications agency. And we want to invest in content that attracts audiences around the world, that we can sell to broadcasters, <coughs> platforms, and also to brands. 
We're interested in working with talented and independently minded producers and creators that want to do something a little bit differently. They want to challenge storytelling conventions, but also challenge commercial models that are traditionally in the marketplace. We, um, we work with producers from all over the world, not just in the UK. I'm based here in London, working in the global team. And I have a specific interest in working with UK and US indies to find great ideas on their slates that we can help them get commissioned in the UK and also roll out internationally. Um, as we have 25, maybe 26, uh, international offices around the world. We've got 250-ish entertainment and marketing professionals working within the Story Lab who are specialists in rights exploitations, both to broadcasters, platforms, and to brands. Um, you see there, I want to have your baby from uh, Tuvalu in the Netherlands. That went out on Monday night, did very well. Be happy, happy to know. And that's something that we brought from, right from a development slate idea from Tuvalu. They had a great little germ of our idea and we, we packaged that with the broadcaster and we're now rolling out those rights internationally. So we have the m muscle of an advertising agency in terms of how we can market products and bring them to market, but we also have the um, know-how of a more traditional distributor in, in how to sell rights to broadcasters and platforms whilst being able to uniquely tap into brand money that we are seeing increasingly come to our screens in a, a more innovative way. And I think I'm a little bit ahead of time and that's me. Thank you so much. Of course, you win brownie points for coming in under time, but on the other hand, that means it's more time for Danny to ask you questions. <laughs> so that is the flip side. So Danny, over to you. And don't forget, get the questions in as well, please. So Story Lab is an investor, it's a distributor, is a partner mm -hmm. and is a co-producer. Mm -hmm. So your your soup to nuts at a la carte menu. Mm. Who picks up the bill? <laughs> We're spending uh, two pots of money. We're spending our own money to invest in IP. Um, and we're also spending on the other side of the business, we're, inv we're investing brand money. We're investing money from our brand partners that want to invest in content that can travel. How can you ensure for a producer that you're going to get it broadcast any more than they can get it broadcast themselves? Well, we, we, we don't have any fixed model. We, we like to try different things out and see, see what works. And uh, I'll be the first to say that some things we've done have not worked, but now we know what does work and what, what doesn't work. But we often come in when we know there's a broadcaster interested. So there might be a, a gap, a size, sometimes sizable deficit. There might be... Um, a, uh, a pilot, but equally, we're a little bit probably more keen to take a risk than others might be because we can come in at an early development stage with partners we really want to work with and, and trust. And sometimes there's no guarantee it will go on air, but we'll, we'll work our hardest and try our best. And in terms of creative risk, I mean, I want to have your baby sounds uh, quite edgy. Is there, any, yeah. is there any subject matter or genre you wouldn't do? Um, well, I, I'd be quite surprised if we turned our hand to sort of more kind of, shall we say, sort of niche, really niche, or adult, or horror, or ultimately things that are not going to appeal to a uh, wide audience. Question just come in on the app, which I'll ask you, but it applies to everyone. Do any of you invest in scripted? Do you invest in scripted? Yeah. You do? Yeah, I mean, to date, we've invested much more heavily and much more on the non-scripted side. The risk is slightly less. We've been trying out different models, seeing what we can do. Um, and we have invested in a few, a handful of scripted development projects um, from sort of known people out there trying to get things on screen. And I, I think that next year we'll be doing more of that. But at the moment, the balance is... The balance is much, much more on the non-scripted side. And you say 25 different territories that you're... Offices, yeah, 25 different you're in. Offices. So a producer brings you something... It won't necessarily happen in this country, but it could happen in 24 other places. Sometimes it does, yeah. Okay. Uh, just a quick question for me, actually. Um, you said some things hadn't worked. Can you give us a bit of insight into what doesn't work for you? <laughs> um, I think it would be fair to say that we, we tried over the last maybe 
two, three years, we tried numerous different things from investing in one-off pilots to investing in slates to coming on deficit financing. I mean, you, you can't guarantee that something's going to rate well. We can try and market it to the best of our ability. We've invested in pilots that haven't gone to series and not because they weren't great ideas, but just because they didn't hit the mark for what a broadcaster, broadcaster wants. And that's why I think it's, I'd like to perhaps spread our bets a little bit wider and, and look at the models in different markets that we've seen work, but we're still willing to try different things and certainly willing to take a risk for, for good content from, from good partners. Lucy, really great to hear from you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so our fifth speaker is David Fletcher. He's Global Chief Commercial Officer for Investment at Omnicom Media Group. Have you ever wondered exactly what Omnicom does and how it works? Well, David can tell us more. Well, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to say everything. Um, five minutes, so I'm going to jump straight in. Uh, I'm hang about. I want to just give you a view on a media agency and program finance, and maybe some of the questions that uh, Danny wanted to ask earlier. Uh, we might be able to talk a little bit about. Quite similar to what Ross was talking about, so you will see some similar sort of uh, uh, ideas on how it works. Let's start off with a question. I think this is really important in terms of the relationship we have uh, in the supply chain, which I'll come to a little bit later. But does it make sense for a broadcaster to pay for a TV show with their airtime, their own inventory? Does it make sense? And I think this is a really important part of the jigsaw of the stakeholders that are in this process. So this is the broadcaster's decision making, but equally these are the other people, similar to something you saw with Ross. We have the producer, a little uh, nod to Danny there. Um, broadcaster, two elements within the broadcaster that you've got to think about. The sales, these are the people we deal with or, or our local buying teams around the world talk to on a daily basis. And then the commissioning side, which would be more the producer, more the, the people you would talk to. The media agency on the Com Media Group, that's us. And ultimately the advertiser. And that's why we engage in this model, because this is a way for us to uh, achieve a different investment or make a more efficient investment in, in TV. Not just TV, actually. You could replace a broadcaster there with the digital platforms. There's no reason why this can't be something with YouTube or Snap or Facebook. A little bit of context on Omnicom. So we are a large, uh, global, 13 billion US business. Um, Omnicom Media Group is the planning and buying division within that. and uh, We have around $30 billion of client money that flows through. So we buy a lot of media. Um, I'm going to guess about a third of that is TV. We operate around the world. So this conversation or this model, uh, it can be anywhere. Um, I see an old pal of mine down at the front, Bushy, there, who once talked about goat herders in Azerbaijan as a, as a format. <laughs> so, so it really doesn't matter. Where we buy media is possible for it to... to... So let's look at the su supply chain, okay? This is what's normally happened. Producer makes a show, broadcaster pays for it, broadcaster puts a show on, that creates an audience. That's what we buy. When I say planning and buying, the media agency buys an audience, and then we sell that to... We, as an agent, in a transparent way, we pass that on to our advertisers. There's not a huge difference when we look at a, a program finance point of view. The structure is kind of the same. The relationship with the producer and the broadcaster is the same. We don't get involved in that. We are not, we don't commission, we don't invest. We leave the producer to do what they do, what their day job is and what they're good at. We don't get involved. But if there's a deficit there, if there's a, a, a debate over the, over the finance, then this way could be interesting. In a way, we pay the broadcast, we pay the producer in cash, the same cash they were looking to get from the TV station. The TV station gives us inventory. We, have to, we do this model to drive value for our clients, so we need to take a little bit extra inventory than the, the broadcaster would normally be paying in cash, mm -hmm. and that's where we come back to the first question. Does it make sense? And so what we, what we find is our local buying teams will talk to the sales teams of the broadcasters and have that debate. Sometimes the answer is yes, and we can do this. And many times the answer is no, and we don't. So we take a really light touch. We don't force this up upon any broadcasters, but it's quite an interesting thing for you to think about. If there's a deficit, it's worth having a conversation. We'll be quick, yes, no to the question. We take a neutral approach. 
So we don't ask for IP. We don't mandate any distribution. Because we're not a producer, we're not commissioning, we're not investing, we don't really care about the genre or the format or the market. It's just about that question. So sometimes we can't do it. We don't, don't have, you know, the, there'll be many times the answer, as I say, is no, but sometimes we get a yes, and this is something we did in, uh, in Canada recently. <laughs> La première compétition de danse au monde à utiliser un système de caméra 360 degrés pour analyser vos capacités de danseur. que ce soit la performance des performances. Ils ont une chance. Vous êtes magique. Oh là là. Yes. C'est un peu comme si toute ma vie, je m'étais préparée pour les Jeux olympiques puis que maintenant, ben, mes efforts étaient récompensés. Tu vois ces frissons-là? On ment pas ici. Je pense que vous avez mis la pression au plus grand danseur contemporain du monde. Les gens me demandent quand est-ce que tu vas arrêter de danser. Je me dis jamais, parce que quand je danserai plus, je ne serai plus en vie. En fait. La danse ne mourra jamais. You, you get penalized for going over. Very neat trick, by the way, getting the video in at the end, because you're getting an extra minute. But, um, Danny, thoughts? Well, Davey, thanks for explaining a bit about the dark arts of the, uh, of the media agency it, deal. Yeah, I'd normally, normally take a lot longer than five minutes. Yes, I'm sure you do. Um, so, as I understand it, Omnicom, you're one of the, the big five agencies in the world, or? or? Generally six, people talk about. You're one of the big six. Um, our friends who are not here uh, from Group M content, motion content as they're now called, they've got 23% of the market. I think they are the, physically the biggest production company in the UK. Obviously, it's impressive that you've made a show in French Canada, but aren't you a bit too late to the party? Have, have they not gone, gone home with the, uh, with the cake? Um, in the UK, probably the answer is yes. Uh, they have a different model or a different approach. Um, it, it, it's, it's not saying it's right or wrong. We, are, we, we come at it from a, a, a client value point of view. So I think the UK is difficult and probably because GME started, I don't know, what, 15 years ago, maybe. Um, we are yeah, most definitely second to the party, but that's a very Omnicom, a very Omnicom way. Uh, You'd like to be late at the party. We call it we call it second mover advantage. Although right. I'm not entirely sure if that's true in, in the UK point of view. But but no, it's it's a fair point. So on the app, the question for you is: What back end percentage do you ask for, and is it only on big projects? Uh, zero. Okay. But the point is, and I find it really interesting. This isn't my, this isn't my my uh, specialty in terms of. Uh, we never ask for it, but more often than not, it gets offered because it feels like it's in the, the partnership. If you're putting up the money, it's not, a, it's not ridiculous to have a small uh, a back end interest, but we don't ask for it. So if you're not taking any back end and you're putting up the money, how are you getting paid? We get more, so in, in the example, which I, didn't, I, I would have really liked to dwell on, but it's like, boom, 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 gotta go quick. Uh, scenario A, it's a million pound for a show, producer pays the, Broadcaster pays a million in cash. Scenario B, they might pay us 1.5 million in inventory. We'll sell that inventory to our clients for 1.2. So they get the 300,000 saving, we make 200. So there is a, there is a margin play in the, in the conversation. David, I'm afraid we are out of time there. David Fletcher, really good to hear from you. Thank you again. Thank you.
Okay, and uh, please give a warm welcome to our final speaker this morning. He's the International President and Chief Revenue Officer at Vice Media Global. He's got direct responsibility for Vice's innovative new online channel, Change Incorporated. I'm going to let Dominic Delport tell you more. Dominic. Hello, everyone. And maybe starting with a video that presents Changing. Here we go. So Changing has been launched four months ago, but it's, a, I would say, a long-term project with different mission and every time one mission, one KPI, like a social experiment. And for this one, it's the UK only. It's geofence, so if you're not in the UK, you can't access the content, changeincorporated.com. Um, we are taking aim at the biggest problem facing the world today. This is a, a kind of palette. Reduce obesity, climate change, single-use plastic, screen addiction, uh, quitting cigarettes and smoking, transform energy and mobility, uh, protect data and privacy, and obviously not tapping into advertising or marketing money, but more corporate or CSR money. Um, so the first mission, which is controversial, we're Vice, we're a fearless company, uh, and we have been uh, engaged in talking about stories and topics that probably most of media were a little bit reluctant. It could be drugs, sex, whatever, addiction. And this is one of the biggest, one of the hardest people die for smoking. And uh, it's also an incredible cost for society, an incredible frustration for the audience, especially our audience. They are smoking twice at the UK population. They want to quit, they fail. 60% want to quit, 6% only quit really. And what we've done in these fi first five months is a body of work that is quite impressive with a dedicated newsroom, uh, nearly 200 articles, nearly 100 videos and documentaries, uh, nearly 20 million video views, 4,000 billboards across UK. Uh, it's 10 times the content that NHS has been able to produce to help people quitting. Our only single KPI, and it's a social experiment till the end of the year, is how many people exposed to our content will quit. We're looking at a substantial increment in the way people are quitting in the UK. This is it, and uh, happy to answer any question. Uh, what I can uh, tell you is uh, where it's bold and where it, it could look a little bit paradoxical, as you understand, it's funded by a tobacco company. So they say, guys, are you, are you, are you joking? And, but the contract, the way we have built it, for, and the same for single plastic, these companies that have been at the heart of the problem, if they don't fix it, if they don't contribute to it, will be off the business. And so if we talk about sugar, if we talk about mobility and oil, if we talk about plastic, if we talk about tobacco, or again, other addiction than our modern society, every time we ask our audience, how can we help you? Well, take the corporate money and let's ask the people who create an issue to help fixing it. And our audience is very transactional, very pragmatic, but they want positive change. And when government can't, when public money is lacking, that is the money that we need to make a positive impact. And the way we qualify it, we'll see, does it work or does it, uh, if it doesn't work, uh, it will stop. The first indication with a third part uh, company is it works. Yes, it's a different one. It's a different one. It was, yeah, <laughs> More dramatic, fun and probably, just to yeah. tease. Uh, we're going to stop there, but um, fascinating. Thank you. And uh, Dominic, just to kick off, I mean, this is a really fascinating model, because as you say, funded by CSR budgets, the likes of Philip Morris, pretty controversial, wouldn't you say, even for Vice? Totally, totally because, controversial. Because, of course, they're also trying to promote e-cigarettes and which is the not, way around Yeah, which is not the, the topic. Like if that. you go on the website, Change Incorporated, you look at the 200 articles, mm. it's about quitting. We're incredibly clear on that and, and incredibly proud of the body of work that has been delivered about quitting. And uh, again, I think that well, I discover a lot of things. I'm not a smoker myself, but I discover a lot of things about the tension in couples, in families. Uh, in the UK, you've got the level of young mom who, that smoke. That is absolutely stunning. There is nine years life expectancy difference between maybe West London and Sheffield. Half of it is because of tobacco. Yeah, I mean, sorry, and so we are sorry, following sorry, the NHS, NHS guidelines, trying to decrease 
young smokers, mom smoking, and so on and so on with the content we're doing. But just to, to, because I, I deal with a lot of these companies who come in and say, look, at, look let's tell them what we're doing with our CSR budgets. Let's look at, you know, how we're, you're frankly, you're doing their PR work for them, aren't you, really? And uh, this is another form of lobbying, because tobacco companies, for example, they can't advertise. They can't speak I mean, to, but they, they're getting, you know, they're getting great PR. That's here. the paradox. You say, hey, how can you have an anti-smoking campaign <clears throat> with, I mean, if they don't pivot their business, they will be out of business. We are talking to younger generation. It's uh, NHS release today. It's the lowest penetration of smoking and also stabilizing of e-cigarette in, in, in history in the UK. So the UK has a very different approach, very pragmatic. It's also a huge cost, a huge problem in the UK, but they have a very proactive and, and, and quite progressive uh, approach compared to the US or other countries. And what NHS delivered today was it works. I think Our pragmatic approach work in the, in the UK, th which is good. I think we've heard, we've, we've heard some pretty weird uh, business models this morning, but the idea of Tobacco firms encouraging people not to smoke is, you know, it's like turkeys voting for Christmas. I mean, no, it's, it's uh, uh, look, it's, uh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. It's, 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 a, it's a strange. It, it's it's a, a, strange a car model. company, car company that was stuck in 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 diesel issue that is pivoting radically for electric. Yeah, I, I do mean, have these one. These business have, have to pivot. I do have one question quickly for you from from the app. So, changing how much CSR funding do you have access to, and how do you make money, or are you a not profit organization? No, we're not a big corp. We're not B Corp. Vice is a company that... You are not. You are a profit-making. We're a profit-making yeah, yeah. company, absolutely. Uh, and so what we're doing is producing content with that kind of social experience. So, for, for instance, we ban all advertising all around this sector across the world for the whole year just to be sure that the content was, in a way, in a pure environment, nothing on the side that could link to uh, a, a kind of an underground marketing issue. Mm -hmm. And we're going to publish the KPI late September, October. You will see this is really three waves across the Very UK. Quickly. Just one second, uh, Daniel, you can have one more question in a second. But before that, uh, you mentioned to uh, turkeys and Christmas. We're going to do the opposite here. Uh, can you please vote now? We've got literally a minute uh, for whose money you'd like to take. Are you, are you swayed by the vice model? Sorry, Daniel, uh, back to just you. Just one more question from the app. How do Indies pitch to you or do you make everything in-house? We, we make everything in-house with a total editorial integrity which is protected and so these journalists i mean you, you know the, the, the vice style yeah, yeah. it's a very but third party producers one. can pitch to you or not third party producer can pitch yeah definitely okay. uh, and again we saw some i think that kicking the habits or changing habits. there was some format that storyla presented uh in france where it's funded by the government money here it's it's not public money but uh corporate money dominic thank you so much thank we you appreciate it really Different model altogether to end with there. Um, thank, votes are coming in thick yeah, and fast. The votes are going yeah. a bit crazy at the moment. While we do that, I mean, they had five minutes, of course, to outline their business models tight enough. I'm going to give you 30 seconds to give us your wrap up thoughts on what you've um, done. Well, other than probably destroying my relationship with uh, all yeah, the funding good luck with that. Uh, companies in, in, in the industry, I actually think that we are in an age where all of these companies offer something that producers need. Um, Although we've done a popularity competition, I don't actually think that all of these companies are competing with each other. In fact, uh, before we started the session, there was a joke about maybe they could all do a co-production together. And um, I actually think that you know, the state of the, of the industry, the more we can co-produce, the more we can find alternative funding models, the better. So um, I would encourage uh, everybody to approach all of these people for funding. And uh, I think we do a result, don't we? I mean, it's very tight, the voting. Incredibly tight. Do you want to do you want to tell us who's won there? Yeah, it was uh, it wasn't a Ponzi scheme. It's uh, Paul Heaney, TCB Rights. <laughs> Paul, congratulations. <laughs> um, unfortunately, in good old Edinburgh TV Festival, we'll stop. A lot of friends, yeah. Anybody who knows Paul already, please raise your hand. Oh, yes, everyone. Okay, um, but I'd like to uh, say a huge thank you to everyone, to our speakers this morning who did that very impressive task of squeezing their business model into under five minutes. Uh, to Danny here for putting his relationships on the line. And, uh, you know, if you want to know where to find him later, I'm sure we can yeah. tell you so you can uh, tell me exactly what you think. Uh, and a huge thank you to all of you who came. There are five sessions going on uh, at this precise time, so we really appreciate Appreciate you coming to this one. And last, but by no means least, to the festival crew who have the hardest job of all and they've pulled it off admirably once again. Thank you.